Oi. All right. Well, this is a real thrill for me. James Turk, founder of Gold Money. Finally, you and I get to meet. It's, it's been a long time coming, but thanks so much for, for coming to see me today. Yeah, it's really great to see you, Grant. And I um, finally had the opportunity. You know, anyone that's been in the gold markets at any point in time in the last 25 years knows who you are. But I, 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 what I want to do today is walk through your career, because you're one of the few people still active in these markets who witnessed the first great bull market in gold. Um, you know, back then you were working for Chase Manhattan, but it's, it's, I'm fascinated to, to find out the differences, how the markets evolved. And I figured we could do that by kind of just walking through your career, seeing as you've been uh, in that market the entire way through. So if, if we can, I'd love to go right, all the way back to the very, very beginning and, and how you ended up in this gold. Were, were, you, were you cognizant of gold before or did you just end up in the gold market and then grew to understand yeah, my, it? Yeah, um, my, grand, uh, my father was born in Austria. Um, in 1912, and uh, they, the family came to the United States after the Austrian hyperinflation. So I'd learned as a young boy, me and my three sisters, um, the value of gold, the value of sound money, um, the, not to you know, incur debts and things of that nature. Uh, and so I carried that throughout pretty much my life. And I always wanted to study when I went to the university to focus on sound money, gold, silver, international finance, and that's in fact what I did. But the interesting thing is that when I went to school, I graduated with a degree in international economics, and I learned how gold was a barbarous relic and it had no role to play in right. the international monetary system. Right. This was the late 1960s, as um, the US was exiting you know, from the traditional you know, gold standard. Um, and I realized that very soon thereafter that what I learned in college was totally wrong and what I learned from my parents as a young boy was absolutely right. Well, well, let's go back to that, that, those formative years when, when you were learning this stuff from your parents because I think you know, there's, there's so few people alive today that, that experienced, certainly in the West, those hyperinflations, the Weimar Republic, Austria. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated to learn the kind of lessons that they taught you and, and their kind of disposition, having been through that, how it affected them and the way they viewed the world. Yeah, it wasn't just that, it was also the Great Depression. Yeah. You know, I was born in 1947, so that was still very much a part of their living memory. And it was um, imbued into me and, and my, my sisters, you know, how tough it was in the Great Depression and what you needed to do. And one of the messages that I, I took away from that was that it, you needed to prepare for things that you just don't possibly expect. And what they told me was that 50% of the people got through the Great Depression okay. 50%, uh, 25% had a tough time, and 25%, you know, it was really, really just terribly bad. Um, and so it always, that sort of stuck with me, that you always have to be able to prepare for the unexpected and always try to get through come what may. And sound money has always, in my mind, played a key role to being prepared for whatever happens in the future. So, so you know, the, the things like the, the spending habits or rather the saving habits, yeah, that's something that we've seen. You know, I remember my grandparents who were alive at that year. Yeah. Very, very different mindset. Very, you never wasted anything. You know, every jar of food was scraped out and then washed out and saved to put buttons in. Or, and that's over the years, that's, that's dissipated now. People don't save, they don't. Yeah, that's it, amazing. Some of the things that you remember as a child, I still remember my parents wrapping up care packages. Uh, after the war, to, you know, this is even the early 1950s when I was just a young boy, and sending them back to Europe because children were starving in, in Europe. But the point about savings, yes, you know, it was very much a, a function, uh, very much a, something that we focused on. Um, you know, I would earn an allowance, I'd know how to save and accumulate money, and I started with a coin collection as one way of saving. This is back in the 1950s and in early 1960s as, as I was growing up. Um, but that savings mentality disappeared, uh, started disappearing in the 1970s, and I think it's pretty much totally disappeared in the 1980s because it doesn't make sense to save fiat currency. You never catch up when you're saving fiat currency. What you need to do is you need to save gold or silver because what gold and silver do, of course, is preserve purchasing power over long periods of time. Well, you know, people have a, people have a, a, a real, either, either they, they take to the whole gold, silver as money story, like duck to water, or they just, it just never connects with them. Yeah. You know, obviously it connected with you, and you have a very strong view about what gold is. So, so let's talk about that, because people have different views. With, you know, it's an inflation hedge, it's a store of value, whatever it is, but you've got a much simpler understanding of it. Yeah, it, you know, there was, in 1912, J.P. Morgan, in testimony before Congress, said, money is gold, nothing else. 
And that really captures the essence of what gold is. Um, you know, money can come from, basically today we call it two ways. It comes from the earth with the um, putting in labor and capital and you mine gold and you mine silver. Or it can be created out of thin air by central banks. Now, when we've seen in recent decades, you know, the problems that arise when you're creating money out of thin air from central banks. Uh, and as a consequence, I think ultimately we're going to go back to the, to the normal thing, which is gold will circulate once again as global commerce. You know, it's interesting what's going on in the States particularly because we've been there before. Uh, after the War of Independence, the currency of the time, which was called the Continental, uh, collapsed and there was basically a hyperinflation. And one of the reasons why the framers of the Constitution got together was to create a more perfect union. What they did is they created a common market with a common currency called you know, gold and silver. And it worked you know, pretty well for 170 odd years. And in the 1960s, uh, and then in the 1970s when the link to gold was formally broken in 1971 by President Nixon, um, we've gone the other, the other way. Uh, we've gone back to what the same types of problems the country had after the War of Independence with that continental currency. So we either have to turn around and go back to what the Constitution requires and once again start using constitutional money, or we're going to be facing, I think, a quite a severe crisis, like 2008, but much, much worse, because there's just too much debt in the system. Well, you know, you talk about, you talk about um, how everything, the, the troubles that have happened since we went on to this pure fiat standard, but, you know, the general acceptance to me, they don't seem to be able to join those dots. They, they see the fiat system, and, and, and by that I mean they see the central banking era as the saviors when problems arise and not the, the linkage between this purely fiat environment and the problems themselves don't seem to make, those connections don't seem to get made by most people. You know, why is it do you think that people have such a, a poor understanding of, of the damage that, that purely fiat currency and free extension of credit does to a monetary system. Well, using my own case as an example, uh, you know, what I learned in, in college was totally wrong. Um, you know, I, I learned a lot of Keynesian theory that had right. no real applicability to how the world really works. And what I did to re-educate myself is I eventually stumbled across the Austrian School of Economic Theory, which even though I earned academic distinction, and at school, uh, I'd never even heard of right. I'd never even heard of it, Austrian School of Economics until after graduating. Um, but that, you know, the books by Mises, uh, the books by Rothbard, mm -hmm. they really explain, you know, how people interact with one another, um, and how we employ labor, how we employ capital to improve our situation in life by fulfilling our needs and our wants. Um, and you do that by hard work and by saving whatever is left over that you don't consume. Um, and that savings and, and or investment, you know, is to prepare for your future and any unexpected events and to improve your standard of living over time. You've grown up in that, in that environment that we've already discussed where I'm sure credit is a four-letter word uh, instead of a six-letter word. You, uh, ha, did you notice the shift to a purely credit-based society? And w were there any signs on the way that made you go, oh, wow, I can see where this is going? Yeah, very much so, because um, I started, I was, I was in you know, college in the 1960s and started with Chase Manhattan Bank in the late 1960s. And I learned banking from guys that had lived and worked through the Great Depression. Right. Uh, so I had a perspective and, uh, and an educational basis very, very different from what came later. Those guys that lived and worked through the Great Depression by the you know, late 1970s had, had retired um, and were no longer in banks. And you started to see that transition within banks themselves, that the conservative traditional uh, method as to how banking should be, that lenders are protected, um, uh, you know, people who deposit money are to be protected and the risks are to be associated with borrowers. All of that started changing. And, you know, we've reached the stage now where banking today, I can't recognize it to, you know, what yeah. I learned banking was back in the 1960s. They're more like, you know, hedge funds supported by the state rather than private enterprises trying to generate a profit by doing good for their customers. So, but, but in that environment when you're, you know, you, here's a young man, ideal, uh, idealistic out of college, reading, learning more about this sound money system at the very point in time where the world is essentially eschewing sound money and moving purely to a purely fiat yeah. currency regime. 
you know, how how did you at the time how did you how did you reconcile that? I mean, did you was I, I imagine that it was either great angst or you kind of it's just happening and there's not much you can really do about well, it. Well, it was a process that evolved over time. Remember, after school, I thought gold was the barbarous relic. Right. And when gold got to what back then was considered to be the ridiculously high price of fifty dollars an ounce. I sort of stepped back and said to myself, well, gold's over, very overvalued, or what I learned in school was wrong. Right. And I started researching and seeing you know, what was going on, and that's when I stumbled across the Austrian School of Economics and Mises and Rothbard and all of that, and basically re-educated myself as to how the world really works. And I realized that gold wasn't overvalued, and what I learned from my parents as a young boy um, is actually you know, the, the most important lesson I could have learned in life, that you know, sound money is important not only in terms of one's well-being from a financial point of view, but it's also important in terms of how people interact with one another in the world, because what we, we operate in a system of voluntary, voluntary interaction. If we were to do a transaction with one another, it's because both of us believe that we are going to be better off by doing that transaction. That's Adam Smith's invisible hand. And the way that transaction best works is when you have a sound money to complete that transaction. Because when you have sound money, the economic calculation that flows from that sound money transcends time, and that's what gold does. It transcends time, and that's very, very important when we start thinking about saving capital and investing capital, because capital is too precious yeah. to waste. It's a lot of hard work, and we shouldn't be wasting capital. Well, you know, it's funny, that's, that's, in my mind, perhaps the greatest crime of all in the central bank era is the fact that capital is essentially, there's no cost of capital anymore. You know, yeah. which is an absurdity in itself, but, but we, we start throwing phrases like that around and we're, we're numb to them now. We don't really think about what that means and how important a, a move that is for, for the financial system. Yeah. One wag said, because there is no cost of capital anymore, let's level the Rocky Mountains and fill out the, you know, the ocean uh, because there is no cost of capital, which is, of course, absurd. Yeah. But what that shows is how absurd these times are today. You know, and that's why I call this environment the money bubble environment, which is the title of my last book. What we are is in an environment where we've lost sight of what normal uh, processes and procedures and uh, basis of interaction is, and we're off on a tangent. But that's the way you know humans progress. Yeah. We don't go in a straight line. We go and we start moving to one direction, and we hit a wall, and we come back, and maybe hit a wall this way, and we come back. So it's 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 a it's a tenuous progression. But you know we we do eventually realize that we make mistakes and we get back on the right road. And I think that's what we've got coming in the not too distant future. Like like the drunk guy getting home from the pub is just you know wall to wall to wall. Yeah, you get exactly. home eventually. But, you know when you when you were educating yourself in the Austrian school, was there was there a moment? Was there one? thing you read that suddenly crystallized all that was cloudy or was it just a gradual process over time of learning to understand well there are a couple of good pamphlets by uh, murray rothbard uh, the case for the 100 percent dollar uh, gold dollar and what has government done to our money they're short pamphlets i think they're probably 30 pages long or something like that both of those were very very critical yeah. mises uh, theory of money and credit is much deeper. It's a hard, that's a hard read. I mean, yeah. It's great, but it's a hard but read. But for me, that was really, I think, the, the eye-opening one. And there was another book that um, you don't hear much about, but it was another eye-opener for me. It was called Organization of Debt into Currency by Charles Holt Carroll, who was a businessman in the States in the 19, uh, 1860s, 1870s. It wasn't actually, he didn't actually write a book. He wrote a, a series of newspaper articles uh, explaining uh, how debts of banking systems was turned into currency and why that was creating problems, which is what we have today. Yeah. You know, liabilities of, of banks circulate as currency, and those liabilities of bank banks, um, the value of them can change considerably for a whole variety of different reasons, and that's what creates uncertainty in, in the financial system. But I think those were probably, you know, maybe some of the earliest books that I read, and of course Atlas Shrugged, I first read that when I was 14 and read it again when I was 22, 23, something like that. So I, I, I recommend that one too. What, what does Atlas Shrugged read like to a 14 year old? I, I'm fascinated to know because I could barely lift it when I was 14, never mind, never mind plow my way through. What, what? Yeah, my sister had a first edition of it, so it had been in our uh, you know, family library for a while. It, when it came out in 1956 yeah. or 57, something like that. I think I probably read it more as a novel at that age rather than the message. But it sort of resonated with me in terms of how things get screwed up by government intervention. Uh, and also that there are people in the world that don't see things normally. And they 
proceed in an abnormal fashion and that ultimately creates problems. I think those are probably the messages I took as, uh, yeah. as a teenager. When I reread it again in the, uh, when I was uh, in my early 20s, obviously I read it at an entirely different yes. level. So let's get back to your, your career. You're in JP Morgan Chase. Now, were you working in the gold market when the London Gold Pool uh, episode transpired? I, you, I was, you just missed it. Yeah. Um, I was doing my international finance uh, in economics course at school as the British pound devalued in December of 1967, uh, which literally shook up the international monetary system. Um, the, so I was obviously following the gold pool when I was still in school and then immediately joined Chase Manhattan thereafter. Um, but I was following very closely all of those developments because remember, gold was a barbarous relic and yeah. I was just trying to figure out why the price was, was rising you know, based on what I had learned. And uh, so I was very familiar with what was going on in the gold pool. And well, can, uh, let me interrupt you this, and I hate to do that, but, but perhaps you could actually, because there'll be people here that don't know the story of the London Gold Pool, and it's such a fascinating story, and particularly as the reserve currency of the world at the time ended up devaluing, which people think yeah. can't happen. Yeah. So if, I mean, if you could tell that story as you saw it, that would be, that'd be great. It's really quite simple. Um, too much debt was expanded, and the, the amount of debt was collapsing in order to get back into gold because people realized that these pieces of paper they had as currency weren't really, um, didn't have the strength and the value that they once thought it did. It's probably better to explain it going back to the 1930s because it's the exact same thing happened in the 1960s. Yeah. In the 1920s, you had this great expansion of debt and when the bubble finally popped, people moved out of deposit currency in the banking system into cash currency because back then they still had gold certificates which were redeemable into gold. But as the 1932 election started progressing and there were rumors that Roosevelt was gonna confiscate the gold, that caused a run on the banking system that people then started moving out of paper into actual gold itself. There was a very brilliant um, former Federal Reserve banker and economist by the name of John Exter uh, in the 1970s who developed this concept of an inverted pyramid. If you could imagine gold at the bottom of the pyramid and the further and further you went up, the pyramid expanded and you had paper uh, pieces or commitments uh, that supposedly were wealth but relied upon someone's counterparty uh, yeah. risk. And it was this bank or was this individual going to make good on that money that I loaned to them when I need that money in the future? And what happens during a collapse, whether it's the 1930s or the 1960s, the size of that pyramid shrinks. People move from these uncertain levels at the top further and further down to gold. So what Roosevelt did is he, he actually devalued the dollar uh, from $20.67 to $35. Um, he reduced the gold content of a gold coin uh, from 22 um, fine grains to 13 fine grains is essentially what happened. Now, when Nixon was faced with essentially the same thing as Roosevelt, what he chose to do, rather than devalue the dollar, uh, he chose to break the link uh, and go into a pure fiat currency so that there was no dollar formal link to gold anymore. So technically he defaulted on the U.S. government's uh, debt, which is the second time because Roosevelt defaulted on U.S. government debt because people who held gold bonds expected to be paid in yeah. gold and instead they were paid in paper money. But, you know, Exodus Pyramid's a great example and, and, you know, the parallels with 08 are, to me, very, very strong because what happened in 08 was exactly that same extinction event. Yes. But in the 30s, in the 60s, those top layers just went away. You know, and, and, and they were written off. And what we had in 08 was the same problem. But because the pyramid had got so wide at the top, they couldn't let that top layer go away. They, they had to kind of prop that up. Well, that's what they argued. Yeah, but no, no, I, I, yeah, absolutely right. That's what they the, felt. But they had the top to do. layer of that pyramid is going to go away sooner or later. And that's what actually is going to cause, in my mind, the big crisis, which is, is coming. You know, whether it's this year, next year, five years, who knows? But 2008 didn't solve anything. No. It just deferred the problem, kicked the can down a little bit road. But as I like to say, the can is no longer a can, it's now a 10 ton boulder. Right. You can't kick that much further because the amount of debt that we have in the system and the only way it's been able to be sustained, it all comes down to cash flow. This is what I learned in banking. And the only reason why this debt is sustained because interest rates are near zero. Yeah. Um, if the government was paying a normal rate of interest, uh, let's say the US government with 20 trillion of debt was paying a normal rate of interest of say, uh, you know, 5%. Uh, that's 4% more, well, 5% more than what it's paying now. That's basically a trillion dollars a year in interest. It only makes 
It only generates revenue of 3.2 trillion. So the way a currency gets hyperinflated is the debts become so huge, the government can't pay it. Uh, they call the central bank to buy that uh, government debt and turn it into currency and let it circulate, the organization of debt into currency. And ultimately, the currency just gets debased. What's going on in Venezuela at yep. the moment, as an example? Well, the, 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 you know, it's an interesting thing. I'm, I'm going to get back to the young James Turk in the 70s in a minute. But, but you know, that Venezuela example is, is an interesting one to me because you're right. It's happening right now. But there's, there's, a, there's a disconnect. People can't substitute the name Venezuela for a Western democracy. They just, they just physically they don't have the ability to do that, even though it's exactly the same system Okay, that has its perhaps bigger flaws than perhaps some of the Western ones, but you know, we're several bad decisions away from, from being Venezuela. And, and it's the same story right the way through time. You and I are both keen financial his, uh, historians, and you see it over and over and over and over again. Yes. You know, what, what is it you think that, that makes people think, oh, that's terrible, but it could never happen here? Yeah. Well, you know, as we were discussing before, the American philosopher George Santayana said, if you ignore history, you're doomed to relive it. And we don't really learn from history. Um, uh, not everybody learns from history, put it that way. If you do learn from history, you'll see that these are repetitive cycles, and you'll learn the difference between money and a money substitute, which is you know, something very, very fundamental. Money is a tangible asset. A money substitute is circulating in place of that tangible asset, but has counterparty risk, yeah. which means it's dependent upon somebody else. It's, a, it's moving up that, that uh, inverted triangle. You know, a lot of people, I think, basically, uh, take for granted what they hear from politicians, read in the newspaper. Uh, you know, they're focused on uh, making a living, keeping their heads above water, uh, trying to save or invest so that their children have a better life than, than they did. Um, and so there are a lot of pressures, you know, on, on people that they may not necessarily have the time to spend reading things like Rothbard yeah. uh, or, or Mises uh, or uh, uh, you know, looking at what could happen in the future. Uh, but I think that's why we, we tend to ignore these things. But also then, I think there are, there are politicians who are either dumb or unscrupulous, who actually, because they seek power, as was the case in Venezuela, um, cause misery for the population as a whole in order to increase their power base, increase their own wealth, and stash millions away in, you know, some other country so that they can go live with their own family and leave the country a mess. Yeah. We've seen it many, many times we, uh, over, the, over the years. It just repeats. So, all right, so let's, let's, get back to, let's get back to the 70s, because the gold market in the 70s was a wholly different beast. You know, we have, um, we have today, we have the, all the demand really for physical gold, certainly coming out of Asia. Back then, Asians had no money. These were very poor countries back yeah. then. So the, the demand side of, of the equation was very much Western, which you know, it's hard to believe that today, but it, but it was. But again, you saw the break of the link on August 15th, 71, and then you saw this, you saw gold let free. You, know, you saw the price start to move to a market price rather than a government uh, mandated price. Right. And so you would have got that, that run up from $35 to $800. So, so you know, walk us through the market and, and the, what you saw change and, and how that felt at the time to be in first, that first of all, the price of gold was going up but its purchasing power is basically the same. Yeah. In other words, when we talk about the price of gold going up, we're talking really about the purchasing power of the dollar going down. And I like to use the example that an ounce of gold today buys the same amount of crude oil it did 60 years ago, 80 years ago. Uh, it, it doesn't uh, necessarily increase your wealth. It preserves your wealth, which is what it's supposed to do over long periods of time. There are, of course, some cycles to gold uh, because you have four forces at work. You have the supply and demand of gold, compared to the supply and demand of the particular product, good or service or commodity that you're measuring its price. So you do get some fluctuations. But over long periods of time, gold tends to preserve purchasing power. And it does this for one very simple reason. This above ground stock of gold, which is what I call gold's M3. You know, we talk about dollar M1, M2, M3. This above ground stock of gold, which is all the gold that's been mined throughout history, still exists as, um, in people's you know, pockets or in bank vaults or whatever. And it grows by about one and three quarters percent per annum, very consistently year after year after year, which is approximately equal to world population growth and new wealth creation. That's why you have this consistency of gold's purchasing power. It's a natural form of money. The other thing that makes it stand out is that there's no entropy when you come to gold. 
It doesn't rot, it doesn't shrink, uh, it doesn't disintegrate. An ounce of gold today is no different than an ounce of gold in Roman times. Uh, it may have been mined in different locations, but it's still the same. Nothing else in the world has the characteristics that gold does. So it, it, it's given gold value uh, because of its usefulness as money. You don't build houses with gold, but you <coughs> use gold as a means of economic calculation, measuring prices, you know, bartering when you go into a market, um, to interact with other people as you go about your daily life seeking to you know, fulfill your needs and, and your wants. So, you know, the gold really is something special, you know, and, and unique. And I got a little bit off of the no, tangent. No, 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 not at all, because you, you're right. It was an important distinction to make. There's me talking about the gold price. Going but, back to 1974, yeah. um, you had a free market more or less in gold at the time. Um, it wasn't until the late 1970s that the U.S. government started this hoarding gold to try to control the gold price and, and keep it from, um, from rising. And there's been a lot of documentation you know, put together by Chris Powell and, and Bill Murphy um, in terms of, uh, and various people, including myself, who've written uh, about it, uh, showing how there was an attempt back in the 1960s and the 1970s uh, to remove gold from the international monetary system because, and what it did is it was to enhance the power of the state and reduce the power of the individual. If you go back to the readings of the framers of the Constitution, the reason why the Constitution worked is there was a balance, um, checks and balance in many, many different respects. And one of those was the checks and balance between government itself, the federal government, and, and the people. And um, you can control the federal government when you use sound money because there's only so much sound money in the world uh, increasing at one and three quarters percent per annum. Um, and anything beyond that, you start building debt and you ultimately create problems on that debt side and go into the, you know, the debt boom bust cycle again. So going back to 1974 though, it, it was more or less a free market at that time. Um, and it very, was very different. First of all, it was only in the early 1970s when you started seeing the commoditization of everything. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the CME, the Chicago Mer Mercantile Exchange, started trading currencies because they were now fluctuating. They were no longer tied the way they used to be under the Bretton Woods Agreement. Um, then you started seeing, you know, commodities, you know, fluctuating wildly because the value of money was going up and down because of inflation. Uh, there were a number of bank failures. New York City uh, almost went bankrupt back in the mid-1970s. Um, and then eventually T-bonds became commoditized. So everything is commoditized today in the world. Um, there is no stability other than gold. So that's, I think, the big difference between now yeah. and then. But, but, but how did that, when that bull market got started in the late 80s, you know, how did that feel? Because there's, there's, there's a clear shift in sentiment there. The inflationary expectations ramp up. But well, the gold market just sees this crazy influx of interest. Yeah, you know, I think initially in the early 1970s, there was a little bit of disbelief uh, as to what was going on uh, because the dollar was being fundamentally changed and people think, were thinking, I think, that the dollar would eventually come back as it always had, you know, to some kind of a sound basis. The, during the, uh, the, the American uh, Civil War, um, the dollar was taken off of gold for a period of time, and it eventually came back to gold in the pre-war basis. Um, anyway, uh, so I think there's a little bit of disbelief, and eventually people started understanding that prices were going up. Nixon put on a wage price control, which was not effective and never was effective in trying to control inflation, because there was just too much money being printed by the banking system. Um, so we had that first initial move uh, that took gold all the way to $200 an ounce from $35 an ounce, from the late 1960s when the London coal, gold pool broke up because it was no longer sustainable uh, up till December of uh, 1974. You then had a correction down to $100, 50% correction. Uh, Carter was elected and in, in August of 1976, during the Democratic nomination, that was the low. Um, and gold started rising from then and it went to the big $850 price uh, in January of 1980 when Reagan then came yeah. into the White House. and and. Volcker was now head of the Federal Reserve and raising interest rates sky high in order to convince the market that the dollar was still worth holding, but it took, you know, 15% government bonds to hold yeah. the dollar. Well, you know, it's funny, something you said there really resonated with me because you, you, you talk about um, people in that era expecting the dollar to go back onto a gold standard of sorts. Yeah. 
uh, which, you know, if we, if we parachute ourselves back to the mid-1970s, of course, that's a very easy assumption to make because at that point in time, A, we'd never had a pure fiat regime in the currency world. Right. And the dollar had been on a gold standard of sorts for more than it had been off one for 200 years. Yes. And it's amazing what that extra 40 years has done because today, if you talk about a gold standard, I mean, people look at you like you're from Mars or you have two heads. It's, yeah, it's, it's, you know, that could never happen. Back then, even though gold and silver had stopped circulating yeah. as currency, uh, gold, you know, by the 1930s, silver stopped circulating in the mid-1960s. People still intuitively understood that gold and silver were, were money. But remember also when Nixon made his announcement on August 15, uh, uh, 1971, he instructed Treasury Connolly to suspend temporarily, yeah. quote unquote. Yeah. Um, so everybody had the expectation that, well, if it's just a temporary suspension, we are eventually going to go back to gold, which is what the Constitution you know, essentially requires. Um, but we never did. And we've been going further and further down this road, building a bigger and bigger inverted pyramid with you know, a small amount of gold at the, at the bottom. But if you're 40 years later now, because no one really has any experience of uh, you know, gold-backed reserve currency. Yeah. I mean, you know, my grandparents do and you know, people have a vague recollection, but it's been such a long time that the people now working in banks, working on Wall Street, running businesses, they don't know anything else. And so for them, it is such a leap to, to, to conceive of, of, of a sound money based system. And, and obviously, a lot of the, the press that you read about the gold standard uh, talks about why it caused problems, why it, why it was the you know the root cause of, of problems going into World War One, for example. When you know, the truth is there, are, there's not one gold standard. There are all kinds of different gold standards, and the gold standard adjusted over the years to be you know partially backed or fully backed, depending on, on what the trade flows were at the time. Mm -hmm. And this idea that we could never go back to a gold standard, as though it's one potential thing, you know, I. I it's laughable to me because I think it'll be forced upon us at some point, sooner or later. Yeah, how do you see that transition taking place? Yeah, a couple of good points you, you raised. And again, I relate to my own situation. You know, back in the late 1960s, early 1970s, who had forgotten what I learned from my parents and was focusing on what I learned at, at, right. at university. Right. Uh, and when gold started going up, you know, saying, you know, what's going on? And I had to re-educate myself, as did many other people at the time to adapt to the new circumstances so that you could you know, save money and prepare for the future and um, you know, interact in the marketplace, fulfilling your needs and your wants. So that type of process, many people will go through again. Um, we saw a little bit after 2008 uh, when people swore that I was never going to be you know, put that much debt again or I'm yeah. never gonna buy a CDO again or you know, stuff like that. But they forget and you know, eventually they will, will have another crisis. So there will be that, 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 that learning process um, going on uh, you know, when, this, uh, when this happens. Uh, but then I, I got off track of the, the point you were asking. No, I just talking about how you think the, the reversion to some form of gold standard. Oh, which yeah, I the gold standard. How, how do you think it happens? Well, we are on a gold standard. Um, there's a question between is it a formal gold standard or an informal gold standard. Uh, gold is the standard. Uh, gold you know, is the measuring stick for all goods and services. Uh, it's been that way for 5,000 years and is likely to be that way for the foreseeable future. We went off any kind of formal standard pretty much in an evolving process through the 20th century until 1971 when all links were, were, were broken and now we have an informal standard. Um, you cannot redeem dollars for gold, but you can sell dollars for gold. Right. And that's where the, 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 the standard you know, essentially comes in. And when you measure the price of goods and services in terms of gold, as I was explaining before about a barrel of crude oil, you see why gold is the standard, why it's the basis for you know, economic calculation. Yeah. Um, to, so to say that it's silly that we can't go back on a gold standard, it is silly that, you know, that we are on a gold standard. We're just not on a formal one. So the question is really, will central banks ever go back to a gold standard? And I don't think so. First of all, central banks are an arm of the state. Um, and states use, uh, governments use uh, central banks in, to enhance their power. And let me give you a little story because you might find this interesting, explains the point. You know, people recognize today that um, the Deutsche Bank 
the, excuse me, uh, the Bundesbank, uh, Germans, um, the German Central Bank, was independent and the governors of the Bundesbank could do whatever they wanted. Um, and you have to ask, well, why did they have this independence and how did that come about? Well, at the end of the Second World War, the three uh, alliances, uh, Britain, United States, and France, they basically created the predecessor of, of the Bundesbank. And they instilled in the Articles of Incorporation and in the minds of people that the central bank and the government has to be separate. Because if they're not separate, the central bank is under the control of the government and can print as much money as it wants. And the last thing the Allies wanted at the end of the Second World War was to have the German Bundesbank printing more money for a Third World War. Um, so you have to recognize that central banks are an instrument of the state. And therefore, unless central banking fundamentally changes to what we saw back in the 18th uh, century, which I don't think is likely to happen, central banks are not going to go back to gold. But the question is, is, is the market going to go back to gold? Um, are people going to start using gold once again for currency? I think that's likely the way it's going to evolve. The question is, is it going to be a smooth evolution or is it going to be a rough transition where governments try to prevent gold from circulating as currency? If we go that way, we know the bad results that occur when governments interfere, interfere with the market process and disrupt people voluntarily interacting with one another uh, in, when they exchange you know, goods and services for goods and services and use money as the means of calculating in that exchange. So my expectation is, is that there may be one or two central banks that go back to gold, uh, maybe, maybe Switzerland, maybe not, I don't know, maybe a couple other smaller countries. But keep in mind too, the IMF says that central banks cannot use gold yeah. as, as a form of money or currency or anything of that nature. Everything is stacked against gold, except the intellect of people who understand what gold brings to the table and have read and understand gold's history. But yeah, it's, it's funny, you know, that, that idea that, that human history repeats. You know, it, gold is a constant through all of recorded human history. Yes. And it's hard to believe that at some point that connection won't be made again. You know, it's there already in, in places like India and China, you know, the Middle East. The connection is there. It's never, it's never gone away. It's gone away in the parts of the world that have had this massive financialization and this, this easy buildup of credit. And you kind of understand why it's gone away. Yeah. Um, but you know, a lot of this began in the 80s. You know, we, saw, we saw stock markets bottom, we saw credit markets bottom uh, in terms of the, the, the bond prices. You know, being in the gold market after interest rates peaked in 1980 and the gold price peaked, you know, those next 20 years, I mean, that was a, that was a desert to be in the, in the gold markets. Right? I mean, what, what, what was that like? Because as, as much as gold is maligned, now and has been over the last sort of 15 years as it's gone up from a couple of hundred bucks to you know, 1900 at one point. Yeah. You're there in the gold market in a period when it went from 800 down to 200. Uh, you know, and not quickly so you get out of the way. This took, this took 15 years. Yeah. Well, gold was overvalued in 1980. You know, assets become overvalued, they become undervalued. And the key to successful portfolio management is to get rid of those assets that are overvalued and accumulate those that are undervalued. Uh, from a career point of view, uh, because I did well in Chase, and my plan had always been to be with them for 10 years to develop the experience, the connections, and then move on to something else. Um, I resigned from uh, Chase in 1980 and joined a uh, um, commodity trader in Greenwich, Connecticut. It was one of the top commodity traders in the States at the time. And, and gained valuable experience working with him, looking not just at gold, but other commodities and how they interrelate. Uh, and then it was from there that I was headhunted and went to Abu Dhabi to manage the commodity portfolio for the Abu Dhabi Investment Authority, which is that country's sovereign wealth fund. And I was there for uh, a few years until leaving and uh, resigning in 1987. And since then, I've done a number of other things. Um, you know, focusing ultimately on gold money. Yeah. Because the idea for gold money actually goes back to 1979, believe it or not. Um, well, we'll, we'll come on to that in a sec, but I just want to get back to this, your period in the Middle East, because you, know, you, you, you move from the establishment bank in Chase Manhattan, you go and learn about the commodities markets. Now, when you move to run a sovereign wealth fund in, in a part of the world where gold is understood, commodities are understood because that entire economy is based around one particular commodity, 
how were the attitudes different? How, you know, did you find that when you were there, it was a completely different perspective on the whole thing? Yeah, it was um, a very different perspective. Um, and just to give you an example, I was discussing this just recently with somebody else. Uh, during the Arab oil embargo of 1973, yeah. um, the Yom Kippur War was going on and the Americans were supplying arms to Israel and the uh, Middle Eastern oil producers um, implemented the embargo and stopped selling oil to the West. Now, most people tend to think that that was because the Americans were sending arms to Israel. But it actually goes back to what Nixon did in 1971 and how the dollar was debased between 1971 and 1973. And the Arabs, as I learned when I was there in, in 1983, 84, um, they um, calculate the price of crude oil in terms of gold, and they realized they were getting a lot less gold right, right. For, for their um, uh, oil than they had been prior to 1971. So, you know, that was as important to them um, as a reason for the oil embargo as it was, uh, you know, that maybe sending the arms to Israel. But you, you, you don't read about that in the West, but, you know, it was one of the things I learned when I was there uh, in Abu Dhabi. Well, we, you know, we, we're in a kind of similar position today now where gold and oil, uh, when you look at the Middle East and you look at Russia and you look at China and the likes of Turkey and Iran, you, there's, this, there's this block forming of countries that either import or export oil and all have an affinity for gold. And there is a clear system evolving there which will enable all these countries to trade between each other, uh, to move oil around yes. and pay for it in gold and bypass the, the petrodollar yes. and cut that out of the system. Now, that, that's, that's a huge development were it to happen. Um, it, I mean, it changes the game completely yeah when you look at that do you do you see that happening from your experience in the middle east is that something that's long been on the minds of that part of the world or is this a new development you think no it's not a new development and i think yeah it, you know things are happening over there that we have to pay attention you know empires do end yeah um it, they've ended many many times throughout history uh, and they tended to end for the same reason you know too much debt debasing the currency you know, it took the Romans maybe 150 years to debase the currency and to, to, from, uh, to bring about the end of its empire. Uh, the British Empire took about 50 years to debase its currency to bring about the end of its empire. Um, the debasement of the dollar started in 1913, so we're at 104 years, so we're going to be somewhere between the Romans and the Brits right. in terms <laughs> of debasing the currency and see the end of the empire. Uh, at the end of an empire, what's next? Uh, and it's quite clear that, you know, China, with the wealth that it's accumulated, uh, and uh, Russia, with the resources that it has, it's a natural uh, attraction to one another. Um, China's got the labor, the wealth, and Russia's got the resources. You know, you can create a lot of wealth by bringing all of those things together. But I don't think that they're going to do anything to trigger the collapse of the system as it presently exists, uh, perhaps out of fear of war, uh, perhaps out of fear of what it might, uh, you know, reactions, unintended consequences, and things like that. So they'll play the system as much as they can um, until eventually, you know, the system is no longer sustainable and they'll, they'll create their own system. But it also has implications. There was a British, um, my, my colleague Alistair McLeod and I have discussed this a number of times, and he brought to my attention a British uh, strategist uh, in the early 1900s, a guy by the name of Kinder, who wrote that? Yes. Are you familiar with his work? I am. Yeah, this, you know, if you bring together Central Asia, you know, that's a real economic powerhouse. You know, it seems to me that the Russians and the Chinese sense that. Uh, they sense that, uh, you know, they are the future or they think themselves are the future. You know, I, I sort of hesitate when I say that because to really have a um, successful society um, and wealth creation and opportunity for people to interact with one another. You have to have some key basics, and this is why the British Empire was so successful. You have to have, you know, rule of law. You have to have private property. It's also why the U.S. had been so successful. Without the rule of law, without private property, um, you, you can't really run a command economy successfully. It just doesn't work. Uh, eventually, um, command economies collapse, as we saw from you know, the various parts of the Soviet Union. Well, I would, I would add tea to that list as well, the British Empire. You know, without tea, we wouldn't, have, we wouldn't have been able to run that empire. So I think that's a very important yeah, one. Yeah, that is add. probably a very important <laughs> one too, yeah.
So, yeah, you know, it's going to be interesting to see how the geopolitics evolve in the years ahead. But, you know, regardless how they evolve, my view is, is that gold's still going to be, you know, going to be there. And even if it's not circulating as currency, um, uh, it's still going to be money. Uh, it's still going to provide the same usefulness that it does today in terms of economic calculation, you know, measuring uh, things over a long time so that a businessman, an entrepreneur can wisely decide how to invest his capital when he calculates prices and goods and services in terms of ounces and grams rather than dollars or euros or any of the other fiat currencies. Um, so, you know, that's, that's in my mind, the, the basic bottom rock part of every portfolio. It's having money. Uh, and real money with no counterparty risk. Own some of that yeah. bottom of the of the pyramid. So, so what was it you think that changed you know, after witnessing the gold bull market of the late seventies, and then this twenty-year fallow period where gold just ground lower and lower and lower? What do you think changed around the turn of the century that that that, that put a floor on the gold, and suddenly people all around the world started thinking, you know, I need to own some of this crazy yellow rock again? Yeah, you can only push an asset to a level of overvaluation or undervaluation so far. And even a government cannot stop, you know, a, rever a reversal of that trend. You know, in, it was in 1990, just before Warren Buffett started accumulating silver, which he was doing in the 1990s, a pack of cigarettes was more than, a, than an ounce of gold. Yeah. Just to put it into perspective, you know, how cheap, um, uh, excuse me, uh, ounce of silver, just put in perspective how cheap an ounce of silver was at the time. So silver was extremely undervalued. The market does not like anything way overvalued or way undervalued. Uh, money moves to undervalued assets, and that's what started happening by the 1990s. Um, so you went from 1974, when gold was very under, uh, overvalued, to 1976, when it was undervalued, then you, when Carter was elected, he went to 1980 when gold was very overvalued at 850. And by the late 1990s, gold was very undervalued when you were talking about $250 yes. an ounce. So you had money um, or wealth moving into it because people understood this was good value. And it proved to be the case. So you had 12 years in a row when the gold price was rising. And you know that 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 seems to me to be a fundamental shift now. You know, we we can talk about there's a lot of argument about gold whether it would go back below a thousand dollars. You know, once but but I go back to 2007, and all the talk about will gold ever break through eight hundred dollars again? You know, that this was this was the big debate. Yeah. You know, once it went through eight hundred, I mean, it never looked back. Once it went through a thousand, it kind of went from a thousand almost doubled. Yeah. And now we're back at, at 1,200 people talking about it going below a thousand again. You know, it's hard to see when you look at the, the amount of debt that's being piled on top of the existing debt load. It's really difficult for me, and I'm, and I'm very happy to be convinced otherwise. I know that you're not gonna be the guy to do that, but, but I, you know, it's very difficult for me to, to envision a set of circumstances where gold goes back below a thousand dollars and stays there. I mean, could there be a washout? I guess, I don't see it happening, but. The only way it could possibly happen is if all of these money substitutes were to be cut in half. Right. Uh, like we had in the 1930s, you know, a lot of dollars disappeared because of bank collapses. Uh, if dollars disappear again because of bank collapses and the government doesn't try to, you know, put those dollars back into circulation, you could potentially see the price of gold rise. You have to look at, you know, the, the quantity of gold available in the world versus the quantity of fiat money available in the world, and then decide, you know, where are people putting their resources? Where are they moving their wealth? Are they moving into gold because it's undervalued or and out of dollars, or is it vice versa? And, you know, the last five years, gold guys have gone through the ringer uh, because um, of what's been happening in terms of the takedowns from time to time, et cetera. But we have to remember, um, the correction probably ended in December of 2015, which was the low in gold, and December 16 was higher, and even with this bad correction in the past several weeks, and we're higher still. So it looks like we have an uptrend forming, and we have a new bull market, which makes sense because of all of the problems that we see out there in the world. It, today is a little bit like maybe 2002, 2003, yeah. um, in terms of where gold is in, in, in relative valuation terms. Well, this, you know, this brings us nicely around to sort of the, the present um, and the future, which is which is every bit as important. You know, now, let, let's get back and talk about gold money and, yeah. and and how and when you formed it and what the genesis of that was. 
Well, the genesis was, it actually goes back to the 1970s. Uh, there was a West German bank called Herstadt Bank that collapsed in 1974. And I was in Thailand at the time, uh, working for Chase Manhattan. And it literally brought the international monetary system down to its knees. And I thought, this is sort of bizarre. How can a medium-sized West German bank do this to you know, banking behemoths around the world? So I basically stepped back and decided to study it and see if I could come up with a solution. Keep in mind, this is a time when I was still trying to get rid of the thought right. of what I'd learned at right. university and re-educate myself as to how the world really worked. Um, so I took it on, and five years later, I finally realized you know, what the problem was and conceptually came up with the idea of gold money. But I just didn't think it was going to happen in my lifetime because the technology didn't exist. I mean, the, uh, it was impossible to make a, a trans-Pacific phone call from Thailand right. to New York. Or if you did, it was going to cost an arm and a leg. I didn't buy my first co personal computer until September of 1979. It was an Apple II with 45K of right. memory because it had an accelerator right. card in it. <laughs> um, but the idea was so powerful that I didn't let go of it, and I continued to refine it and think it through uh, the 1980s. Um, I continued to build up my knowledge by collecting and, and reading books on money and banking and gold and silver. And by the late 1980s, early 1990s, I realized the idea might happen sooner than what I thought. So I started researching uh, patent law, or patent law, as you say here in, in the UK, and um, realized that it was a patentable idea because it advanced the prior art. It created a new type of currency that solved the Herstadt crisis problem. Um, so I hired a patent attorney in 1992, and we filed the first patent application in February of 1993, long before the commercial possibilities of the internet were realized. But because I was studying what was going on in the technology, I realized that it was moving this way. So I wanted to start carving out some intellectual property. Well, well, so, so just explain at that point in time, what was the idea of gold money? How was this concept? Gold circulating as currency digitally. Uh, rather than hand-to-hand, -hand. Um, and it was actually physical metal moving. And the way it would move is it would overcome all of the issues related to gold in the past. You know, people would say it was heavy to move if you wanted to transact in large amounts, or you could scratch it, and that would debase or, you know, uh, take away some of the value of, of the gold, um, and, you know, all kinds of other excuses. But what, what the idea was is that the gold would stay in a warehouse, a vault, uh, safe and secure, um, and you would click gold from your account to someone else's account um, simply by changing the title. So you, instead of having a paper representation, which is what bank liabilities are under the old gold standard circulating, you actually had gold circulating, but it stayed in the vault because you're changing title ownership from one person to the other. That's why we use the term in gold money a holding instead of an account. It's actual physical ownership of gold that you own uh, and which you can use you know, to pay other people. So, I mean, this was an idea a long, long way ahead of its time. I mean, you, this was an idea that, that, that really was a dream at that point because the, 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 yeah, was, the mechanics with which you could have done it, did, I mean, essentially didn't exist. If you were one of those nerds with their Apple II reading all these you know, trade mags, maybe you had an idea. Working that, with VisiCalc, if you can remember that. Yeah, yeah, I do. <laughs> but but, but you, know, you, you maybe were ahead enough in trade mags that you understood that the internet, whatever it may be, yeah. was coming, or, or certainly some means of global Yeah, I didn't know it was going to be the internet. No, of course but, not. But there was going to be some means of communicating digitally with one another. It was, that was my conclusion. And that's why I started carving out the intellectual property. So, so when, you, I mean, when you finally get to launch that business, you know, when all, the, all the, the, the bricks are in place to enable you to establish it on a, on yeah. a solid footing, you know, how, how was it received and how did it, how did it grow? Well, what we did is in the late 1990s, I realized the time was probably right because um, the gold market was likely to be turning soon because yeah. it was very undervalued then. Uh, and I wanted to have the wind in my sails. So I, I got together uh, four other guys and myself. We put together some money uh, and started the, the, the business. Uh, we formed the company in 1998, as I recall. And um, it took about two and a half years to actually build the, the network. Um, and we launched in February of 2001. It's good and timing it, right there. Yeah, and it started very slowly. You know, we put three bars of gold in there. And uh, I was waiting for everybody to come and start using it because yes. it's such a great payment mechanism. And it quickly became clear that Gresham's law was taking effect. The guys that understood gold 
uh, knew that this is Sir Thomas Gresham, who is Queen Elizabeth I's uh, financial advisor, that people spend the bad money and they save the good money. And um, what was happening is everybody, with my natural market was because I was understood, uh, people knew me from the gold market. The natural market was people who wanted uh, gold and, right. and understood gold and, and wanted a convenient, and right. economical, and safe way to, to transact in it. They didn't want to actually spend the gold, they wanted to save it. Right. So within a very short period of time, we started changing the focus on gold money more and more as a savings mechanism rather than as a, spend, a spending mechanism. But recently, with the transaction that we did with Bitgold, we're focusing yeah. more and more on the spending side because I think the timing is right to have an alternative means of making payments outside the banking system, and that's what gold money offers. Well, that's I mean, and that's what I want to come on to, you know, to, to to wrap this thing up, and, and that is the present and the future. You know, you uh, you sold the business to Josh and Roy, who were then of Bitgold. Well, we merged. Well, you merged. So big um, yeah. I've never sold any shares. No, okay. you merged. Oh, you're, you're right. My family's never sold any shares. Um, you know, and, and these are two of the brightest young men I've come across. I yeah, mean, they're really both very bright, brilliant thinkers. Uh, you know, super nice guys, but just there's a there's a weight and a depth to their intellect that that you don't often find, yeah. particularly amongst bankers. You know, Joss is an, an engineer, and, you know, but Roy's a banker. You know, but these guys just think about this in a way that that most people don't. So you know, when they when they started talking to you, you know, what was the vision? For the company, because uh, you know, here's here's a guy who's been in the gold market since the '70s, is you know, as a sound money guy, you, know, it, it, you couldn't be more traditional. Yeah. And here's two guys who are thinking things that the world probably isn't ready for yet. You know, how the, how do those conversations go? It went very very well. I know. Sure. Um, you know, my first conversation with Roy, um, a mutual friend had introduced us, and I, I really wasn't expecting much, but uh, you know, I thought it maybe be a 15 minute conversation. We ended up chatting for an hour and a half. Uh, and at the time, you know, I was recognizing as well, you know, I'm seven decades on the face of this earth. Um, so there has to be a transition uh, and the transition to take it to a new level. And I saw, you know, Roy being able as the ideal person to take, uh, you know, gold money to that new level. So from my perspective, um, it, uh, th that, that's how I saw it. And I, the other shareholders saw it as well. Um, and, it's worked out very, very well. Uh, I've been very happy with the progress that's been made over the last um, uh, couple of years. And we just announced this morning that there's gonna be um, another improvement in the uh, gold money business in Jersey, which is the original business where we're gonna start payments once again for people who have Jersey relationships. So I'm quite excited about the future for gold money and its potential, particularly given that we're like 2002, 2003 again, and we've got several years ahead of us where gold is going to start flying and that's going to be bringing a lot of attention to gold. Well, you know, we started off talking about, um, you know, gold being money and nothing else. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, it's been anything but money for a long, long time. Money being gold and nothing yeah, else. Yeah, exactly right. And, and it's, you know, it's been anything but for a long, long time. And it feels as though We've seen the first seeds get sown of, 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 of money being gold once more. You know, I don't know how the transition goes from here to the point where it is again. I don't know what it looks like when we get there, but it feels as though the world is on an inevitable path back to that point in time again. Yeah, that's the way I see it. And hopefully it'll be a smooth evolution uh, without war and things of that nature. Um, you know, if people, if governments just allow people to get on with one another um, and interact in, a level playing field where the government doesn't have any advantage or the people don't have any advantage and you can achieve that level playing field with sound money. I think we have a very bright and prosperous future for mankind. That's the way I see it. Uh, we're just going through an aberration like we've done many, many times before throughout history, an aberration where we've gotten off the main path. Um, we've got too much debt. We're using a money substitute rather than money itself. Um, people have lost sight as to what money is. Um, and ultimately, what we're seeing is it's unsustainable. And the interesting thing is it's unsustainable in a number of different ways. Um, you know, you, you see the depletion of fishing stocks, and you see, you know, all of these homes being built in the south of Spain that are you know, still unoccupied 10 years later. All of these things relate to malinvestment of capital. Um, you know, when you make capital cheap, and that's what central banks do, it, it destroys um, normal market processes and comes up with bad consequences like all of these homes in Spain or too many fishing boats plying uh, the, the North Sea. Um, 
So we have to go back to basics. We have to go back to sound money. And it's going to happen sooner or later, and hopefully it will evolve in a smooth process. Joe, it's the perfect way to end it. It's been a fascinating hour. You know, I'm yeah, I've so, really enjoyed I'm it. I'm so pleased we've got to do this, finally. So, so thank you very much for the time. Well, thank you for the opportunity. I really enjoyed chatting with you.